Thank you so much for joining us again today. This is a wonderful day with technology of uh, trying to learn how to do Zoom breakout sessions. So keep us uh, sending in your messages to Jeff and he will do his best to make sure you can attend the other sessions as well, uh, not only now, but later today. Um, I'm presenting on advocating for empowerment and self-care. Um, many of us in Indian country, uh, just by nature of the statistics and uh, challenges that we face in many of our communities, disability has become a natural part of our daily living. Um, unfortunately, we as Native people have the highest rate of disability, so that's another challenge that we have in terms of many of us either personally or have a family member that have a disability. And so we become advocates. I was an advocate for my dad who had MS for 37 years. And I was an advocate at you know, eight, nine, 10 years old before I knew what the word meant. I remember, and this was before ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, but I would remember going into the back of restaurants through the kitchen entrance to evaluate access issues for dad's wheelchair. My brother would go through the front door and mom would prepare dad uh, if we got the thumbs up that we could make it into that particular restaurant or whatever uh, building that we were trying to access with dad. So as a youth, I grew up with that reality. And I know many of us in Indian country have that same reality of caring for a family member with a disability. So this is something where I uh, always are trying to uh, address my personal experience with a lot of the things that I teach over the years. I've been fortunate to have a wonderful career in the world of disability, the culture of disability, I prefer to call it, um, because of that experience as a, a, a son of a father with a significant disability, I saw what true strength was. And that was my dad doing everything he could to work for as long as he could as his disability was progressive in nature, yet he kept on fighting and kept on doing the best he could under his circumstance. And that's something that he always uh, would address with, um, was just do the best you can under the circumstances. And when someone says that with that kind of a challenge, obviously, that gives you strength as an individual. Seeing someone with such significant disability, quote unquote, challenges, uh, say something like that. So uh, acknowledging my father as a, a mentor and a, a great example of what someone with a disability can do. So some of the things I'll be addressing today is advocacy, empowerment, and self-care. As you see here, Advocacy is basically what I was sharing is just trying to make sure that we have support and uh, for a particular cause or policy from a governmental aspect. An example of advocacy is we are constantly advocating for our traditional indigenous values and our ways, our languages, uh, political, economic, social, all of those elements can be impacted by advocacy. And in this particular instance, disability advocacy is very important. Empowerment is what I'm all about. I want to empower our future generations and to ensure that empowerment is a choice and option for everybody in Indian country. So to empower someone is the process of becoming stronger, more confident, especially in controlling one's own life, claiming one's rights, self-determination. Those are key words in terms of empowerment for our people with disabilities. And many of us are working the political, federal, state, tribal governments to ensure that people with disabilities have that representation, inclusion, and empowerment within their communities. And finally, self-care. As I shared, many of us are caregivers for family members or uh, spouses or whatever the situation may be, many of us become those caregivers, particularly in Indian country because of the lack of services available. So that's uh, many cases we'll have our grandparents or someone with a disability living with us. And I know that we've had hospital beds in our house as well. And we made this into an accessible house, uh, even with uh, big and tall issues. My dad was a big man. And so we had to have even extra 
issues because of his size and his disability. So self-care, we need to make sure that we take care of ourselves through balance from my perspective, and I'll be sharing some of those perspectives uh, later today. I wanna share my family history uh, from a traditional way. We generally introduce ourselves through our family. And here is my uh, grandfather Stabber who was with Red Cloud at the White House in 1872, negotiating peace with President Grant. So that's a wonderful family history to have Grandpa Stabber being one of those 17 leaders that went to the White House to advocate uh, for our people in those days in 1872. As you see, he had a long life and he's lived, he lived much longer than the current uh, uh, average age of Indian men in particular on Pine Ridge and I'll address that later as well. I'm named after uh, Kills on Horseback. Tumshunka Akan Wachakde is my Lakota name. And this is the grandfather uh, that I'm named after. And he was another traditional uh, man that uh, trained my mom and the generations as well. And he represented the family in a good way as well. And then May Stabber Featherman, our Unchi, our grandma, she's holding a, a newborn baby. And the horse there you can see is. Uh, uh, dressed uh, with regalia as a celebration of a newborn. Unfortunately, uh, we lost that baby as we lost many of our young ones, not only in those days, but today we're losing way too many of our young ones due to uh, public health issues and some of the challenges that we have in Indian country. So there's mom and dad when they got married back in the early 60s in South Dakota. And then there's me, uh, kind of a baby Huey baby there, if you will. But uh, I know Grandpa Louie's probably straining to hold me up there for the picture. But this is back home on Pine Ridge. And you see the old military Quonset hunts that were provided for housing for Indian families back in those days. So uh, here's my uh, family here. My dad, uh, as you see, he was progressing with disability. So he, uh, this is at my brother's wedding. And uh, it's just wonderful that we were able to have dad as the rock, the, the literal foundation of our family. Uh, even though he had a significant disability, he had true strength and representation in our family. So as we move on, I want to address what we are, some of the challenges that we have with trauma. Uh, some of the historical events, oppression, adverse effects, both as children and adults. Pandemic, obviously, uh, the current pandemic is very impactful for Indian country and our resilience as native people. The unfortunate reality is many of our native communities are facing issues where we have to have resilience. And that's a reality that we have in terms of how do we address uh, these challenges and just another natural element that we've had to develop as native people is resilience in addressing those challenges, those barriers, that ignorance that we face on a daily basis. So when we think of healing and culture from a traditional aspect, um, I like this quote, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the, thing, to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. And that was Chief Seattle. And what I see here is that we as two-leggeds, as human beings, we are all part of a tiroshpae, a community, a tribal perspective of people, of a group of people. We uh, always had that within our traditional knowledge of inclusion and disability is not even a word in our languages. We don't have a term or even a philosophy of disability it was always a circumstance, but you always had a role in the community. So through within our uh, native communities with healing and culture, we have a lot of the um, traditional ways that we still utilize today in contemporary America. Our talking circles, uh, this, this summit is a result of a talking circle. So obviously great things can happen when you get community members together in the circle and discuss what the needs are for the community so that whatever we do has the buy-in from the community and inclusion of the community that we're serving. So talking circles are something that I continually use today uh, with new grants and new programs 
to ensure that we have that uh, um, inclusion aspect as well as ensuring that we're doing the work that is needed for those communities. And community members know best what those needs are. And uh, we, many of us still have traditional healing ceremonies, our sweat lodge, the longhouse up in the uh, Eastern Northeast tribes, uh, our various honorings, we're honoring someone today, um, our song and dance, um, all these things are healing. The drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth, so it's wonderful to hear the drum and to go to these events. And I know many people have been uh, suffering because they haven't been able to attend a lot of these events due to the pandemic. So we have things like uh, um, social distance powwow on Facebook and different groups on social media that are sharing dancing and songs and language that again, through technology, it's not a replacement, but at least it's a, a way that we can hear the drum, the songs and uh, see the dances as best we can through technology. Our elders, our spiritual leaders, they are key to uh, our uh, traditional knowledge and well-being for our communities. And the pandemic has taken many of our elders too early. And many of the elders in training, the young ones that we've lost, would have been those spiritual leaders. So what can we do to address the loss as a result of the pandemic? Incorporating traditions into our contemporary systems. I always say that I Indianize programs that may be based on Euro-American philosophies or uh, models. So we, uh, I think all of us as native people kind of Indianize or indigenize some of these systems so that they work for our people. And of course, public health and Indian health service programs uh, are challenges for us, but we utilize them as best we can. Indian health services is funded at 60% capacity. So if anything is funded at 60%, they're gonna have significant challenges. And then ultimately for our healing is the cultural aspect of our humor. Indian humor, we always, uh, find a way to try to laugh. And even at the Phoenix Indian uh, Hospital here, I was with my uncle for appointments and you could just hear the staff laugh and you know, just Indian humor is always out there. And that's part of our healing through culture. Now trauma, we have a, a various uh, amounts of trauma that have impacted us in various capacities. Cultural trauma, historical trauma and intergenerational trauma. So I see the intergenerational trauma occurring now uh, in terms of lost uh, culture, lost language. Many of our young people are screaming for indigenous knowledge and it's our responsibility as elders and elders in training, if you will, to provide that uh, information and knowledge for future generations. And what's wonderful about the young ones is they really are hungry for our traditional ways and Again, it's our responsibility to do whatever we can to share that knowledge so that the intergenerational trauma impacts are less um, impactful for in a negative stance for many of our people. Um, when you look at this, uh, this is from uh, uh, Bigfoot and uh, this, uh, she had done some great work on identifying some of the connections of trauma for Indian country. And you see here, obviously, historical events, recent events um, with George Floyd. Uh, the world is now readdressing racial uh, issues as a result of that horrible murder in Minneapolis. And now other cultures like Native people are being addressed as a result. Obviously, disability is a, another aspect of manifestation of trauma. Um, again, personal, family, generational, and Tioshpai, our community. And you see the cumulative collective trauma that have some of these outshoots of poverty, oppression, and historical events, all of which lead to that core circle of that trauma. And some of these are the manifestations to that and responses to that trauma. So when you look at uh, some of the response to trauma, we have a lot of uh, substance dependency, uh, abuse obviously is there too, but a dependency is a disability. Um, again, we need to numb the pain. Many people are numbing that pain of that trauma through utilizing substances uh, or other medications that uh, often can do a lot of damage. And some of that self-destructive behavior, we know that we have 
uh, unfortunate levels of suicide and uh, depression, anxiety, and violence, and some of these things that are manifestations of that trauma and unresolved grief. So again, how do we do this? The manifestation obviously as a result of the response is dependency, diabetes, depression, um, all these different disability aspects that can manifest from not being able to deal in a good way with that trauma. And all of us as Native people have that trauma element just from the history of what our past generations had to endure. So the boarding school era, some of you may uh, be uh, kids of or personally went to a boarding school. Um, fortunately, today's boarding schools are much better. We have Native people running them. And uh, of course, our languages and our culture are more respected. But the original purpose of boarding schools was to uh, take away our culture and make us American versus indigenous. So those boarding schools did a lot of damage and uh, as a result, uh, many generations of people didn't have that ability to parent or experience the quality parenting when they were young people in these boarding schools. Growing up without that uh, that connection of people. And, uh, and this is another element that uh, I go into in a lot of my other lectures and films that I produce is addressing some of the trauma from boarding schools. So resiliency, what is resiliency? So again, all of us as native people have some sort of resiliency in my opinion. The capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. So what makes you as an individual strong, tough, remarkable, native? Think about some of the things that you have, some of those strengths that you apply every day that you may not be thinking about but kind of do that self-evaluation of what makes you resilient as a native person or a person with a disability. I see the culture of uh, Indian country and the culture of disability having many parallels in regards to self-determination, in regards to appropriate labels, in regards to inclusion. I see many of the, some of those things, challenges that we face in the culture of disability and in our culture in Indian country are very similar. As I mentioned, we don't have a word for disability in any of our languages, but when you look at disability, that is not a positive reference. It's identifying and focusing on what you cannot do. What are you able to do? What are your abilities? You know, think about what are the abilities that you have, no matter what, all of us have ability, no matter how significant our disability may or may not be. So in a personal aspect, you know, how do we deal with and work with those circumstances and barriers and challenges? Our family, again, uh, if we have a good, strong family, I'm very fortunate that I came from a strong traditional family and where disability wasn't a disability, it was just what can dad do and what can we do to make it better? And then generational from a Lakota perspective and from many of our traditional native perspectives, we are supposed to represent our people, our family, our community seven generations behind as well as seven generations ahead. So when you think about it, that's well over 200 years of responsibility. And it's a big responsibility, but a beautiful way to think of those future generations that you will never see but the footprints that you leave or the wheel prints or the prosthetic prints, whatever print that you may have is uh, going to impact those future generations. And again, community and utilizing our native ways is an important aspect uh, to resiliency. So the capacity to recover quickly, you know, that's our resiliency. We're always dealing with whatever challenges that all of us face in our communities and how do we make it into a positive or at least manage it so it doesn't have as much negative manifestations of trauma? So do uh, adverse child effects uh, impact our families, communities, ourselves? Uh, uh, absolutely they do. So how can we minimize those adverse childhood effects as best we can under the circumstances that we all face? And then how do we stay balanced in your daily life? I'll be sharing some of my examples through the medicine rule philosophy 
uh, in regards to balance. Now, um, before I go on, I'm going to see if there's questions or is anyone listening that can notify me of questions? <laughs> um, I want to make sure I'm I... monitoring the chat, Jim. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you uh, please, if I miss a question, please let me know. <laughs> so now as we go in, we're dealing with obviously COVID-19. Uh, we've gone through purposeful pandemics in the past. All you have to do is Google Amherst. And he was a colonial governor that utilized uh, pandemics as a war measure of warfare and uh, against tribes in that area. Now it's almost warfare today, what we're dealing with with COVID-19. And COVID-19 has shown a bright light on underserved populations. We as native people have always known we're underserved and unaddressed, but COVID-19 made it a worldwide issue because of the significance that we have faced with COVID-19 in Indian country. So uh, again, we feel devastated uh, when you look at here in the New York Times, back in July of 2020, they are, were already aware that Indian country was being impacted by COVID-19 more significantly than other populations. So you see all these negative and reality statistics of what COVID-19 is doing to our communities, not only back in July, but still today. So again, when we see that we're four times the rate, we have uh, also uh, uh, higher infection rates. Uh, the US Commission on Civil Rights has even identified that Navajo Nation's being ignored. And this was back in July. Fortunately now, and, and then here's our community stepping up saying, we must do something for our people. And many of our communities stepped up on their own in order to address the, the current uh, challenges of the pandemic. So you see here the Navajo Nation back home in South Dakota and my wife, uh, Jill, her tribe at Hoopa Tribe also had some issues with the pandemic. We all have actually, but here at Navajo, they were doing whatever they could to protect their community and setting up checkpoints and doing measures through their government to protect the elders and the population. Back home on Pine Ridge, we did our checkpoints so that we could do contact tracing and know who was coming in and out of our community to make sure things were safe back home on Pine Ridge. The governor of South Dakota tried to force us to stop these checkpoints, but we, uh, through tribal sovereignty, said we will not. We will continue to protect our people. And in Hoopa in California, Northern California, my wife's tribe, the governor provided uh, state highway signs so that the tribe could identify that tribal lands were closed to please, please do not stop and just drive through. So again, depending on what state you had, uh, you were dealing with different uh, support or um, resistance to our measures from sovereign nations. Now, finally in February, uh, Navajo Nation was declared a disaster area. So now there are federal funds to help provide services to those communities. So again, it's been a, another negative impact of the uh, COVID-19, the current pandemic, and how can we find a way to address that loss of our elders and our traditional knowledge as a result of losing too many people too early. As I shared, I was an advocate when I was eight or nine years old uh, going into those restaurants to see uh, if dad could access with his wheelchair back in the 80s. And uh, Chief Joseph is a, a great leader. And he said, treat all men alike, give them the same law, give them an even chance to live and grow. Well, that's very logical, isn't it? Unfortunately, we had to make laws, civil rights in modern America. And even 50 years ago with civil rights, we still have challenges today including ADA in the 90s. We needed to make a civil rights for people with disabilities because for whatever reason, uh, current contemporary America seems to exclude uh, people with disabilities and we have to make law to make sure that we have forced inclusion. So here's Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's the civil rights for people with disabilities. Our sovereign tribal nations do not have to incorporate ADA 
but I'm happy to say that many tribal nations already had ADA measures in their tribal policies and regulations because of our value for elders. And many of our elders have disabilities, so we naturally uh, provided accommodation for disability. Uh, there's still room to grow, obviously. So again, why have we been impacted by COVID-19? Well, our healthcare, as I mentioned, is underfunded. Uh, this is a uh, treaty language promise of all care and protection. So my brother did some research and looking at uh, some of the funding levels of uh, health service uh, in the United States. And you see here that Indian Health Service is funded, and this was back a few years ago, but it's still pretty close to the same, at $2,000 per patient. And then when you look at prisons, federal prisons, they get twice the amount per patient. And then of course, Medicaid, VA, and Medicare are significantly higher than IHS. But what is the message from our political leaders in regards to funding of Indian healthcare at 60%. Why are we getting half the amount of medical care than our prisoners? And I have family members in prison and I'm glad that they have great healthcare or not great healthcare, but healthcare. But why is it double? What is the message from our federal government when they're funding prisons at twice the amount of Indian health services? So that's something where we need to advocate and ensure that our congressional leadership is aware that they're funding uh, Indian Health Service at the lowest rate than any other healthcare system in the United States. And what is the result? Here back home, the average life expectancy from this study was 81. And back home on the red uh, for Indian people was 54 throughout the state. So why is that? Why are we dying at a significantly earlier rate than our uh, Euro-American brothers and sisters? Again, the healthcare issue, even though we have a legal right to healthcare and we're mentioned in the constitution three separate times, we are still dealing with a federal government that will not address Indian issues appropriately. So every time I go to DC and walk the halls of the Senate and the representatives, the house, I'm constantly advocating for increasing funding for healthcare to equal our federal prisons. Then we will double Indian healthcare as a result. Here's a life expectancy measure that I found to be not only interesting, but very sad in reality. When you look at Hawaii it has the highest rate of uh, life expectancy, Mississippi the lowest, South Dakota is near, is near the bottom. But when you look at Summit County in Colorado, that's the highest rate of living at 87 years average. And it's only 400 miles away from Pine Ridge. So why are we dealing with some of those challenges today? Unfortunately, again, it's the healthcare and the average life expectancy for Indian men back home on Pine Ridge is 48 years old. So here's a statistic from 2004. We knew this back then. But here we are today still dealing with the same issues and the pandemic has again shown a light on these issues. So obviously what we want is equality. We want healthcare. Oops, I'm getting a low battery here sign. I better plug in. <clears throat> but equality and equity, here you see the fence analogy. So here's equality, everyone gets equal, but there's still some people that are left out. Then equity shows that, okay, now everyone can see over the fence. And then let's hope someday that jobs like mine as a cultural diversity uh, trainer will not even exist. That we as a society will be liberated enough to where we will not need to have diversity trainers or disability representatives to ensure inclusion. So let's hope we as uh, two-leggeds as human beings evolve so that we can truly have an equitable, inclusive society. And again, treat all men alike, give them the same law, give them an even chance to live and grow. Chief Joseph knew this years ago. Now, empowerment. Um, I want to share my perspectives of empowerment uh, with you because that's something that I really believe in, in terms of uh, um, what we need for Indian country. 
So this is something where I feel it's very important um, to uh, address. And I'm gonna take a moment here to uh, get my power cord and plug my computer in before I run out of power. So if you could give me just 30 seconds, I'll be right back. And if there's any questions uh, from the moderator that I can answer now, please let me know and I'll be back in 30 seconds. Okay, I'm back. Were there any questions or comments that I can address at this point? If not, we'll have an opportunity at the end of my presentation for any uh, dialogue. So empowerment. Uh, this is something that I've been a believer in for years. And the term empowerment is actually rooted in, uh, in the women's movements for women's liberation, if you will, that, again, that liberation of e equity over equality. And it's power given to someone to do something. Process of becoming stronger and more confident, especially in controlling one's life. Now, I think all of us want to have this in our daily living. Here's something from an organization in Nicaragua. And what do you see in this model of empowerment from the Children's Research Network? Obviously, the core element in the middle of these three circles is empowerment. Capability, attitude, and conditions, and resultant opportunities from those conditions, in this case, reservation communities. So what I see in this model is medicine wheel. It's the traditional knowledge that we've had for thousands of years that many other organizations are now seeing as a valuable model of health and wellness. So now people are catching up to us in contemporary American healthcare or uh, whatever uh, issue of public health and wellness. They're starting to utilize a lot more of our traditional methods because they work, quite honestly. I'm obviously biased as a traditional native person that believes in our traditional knowledge models, but I see many non-Indian brothers and sisters utilizing this. Just on the news, the owner of the Cleveland, Cavani Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team uh, is from Detroit and he's investing money to rebuild Detroit that is a community that in peril financially in poverty. And they utilize talking circles. They didn't call it talking circles, but they went into those communities to see what would work for those communities. So what I saw from the Cleveland Cavaliers owner was someone utilizing traditional knowledge to rebuild his community in Detroit, Michigan. So again, what are those uh, habits that we have for empowerment? Think about the habits that you have every day. What are a part of those habits that are leading you to a better life? We all have- Jim? Habits. Yes. I'm sorry. There's a couple of questions here. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for, uh, is there not a method of legal advocacy through the Department of Justice like the ADA for Native Americans? Ah, the Civil Rights for uh, Indians was in 1968. So as we know, Civil Rights in 64 came along, but the, of course, they forgot Indians. So four years later, they incorporated Civil Rights for American Indians, which many people are not aware of. But again, they did minimum standards for inclusion. So unfortunately, there isn't uh, what was fortunate in the Nixon administration is President Nixon was, in my opinion, the most influential modern president for Indian country. And it just happened to be that his football coach at Whittier College was a La Jolla tribal member. So he was, one of his mentors was an Indian man. 
And uh, so he learned that Indian from Indian country and our philosophies that was different. So we have the self-determination acts and various different acts from the Nixon administration and President Ford and Carter also passed uh, many uh, important Indian uh, regulations, but we haven't had that from any other president since. I think today's president may be open to doing some more regulatory and federal action to protect tribal sovereignty. And I think that's what we can do collectively is to make sure that Deb Hallen, Secretary Deb Hallen, who is our first ever American Indian secretary <laughs> to be appointed in, in the presidential cabinet. Uh, she's a wonderful person. I've had the honor of meeting her. And I think she's going to do uh, great things, at least addressing Indian issues uh, outside of the BIA and interior. She'll be able to influence some of her other cabinet uh, colleagues to incorporate other Indian issues. And I plan to share disability with her so she can talk to the Health and Human Services Secretary. So we have one more question. Uh -huh. Why do you think people of, from some tribes don't implement ADA policies on their reservations, such as making accommodations and providing accessibility to all tribal buildings, et cetera? Um, I think, again, it's an awareness issue on disability. And then for some of our communities, it's a financial reality. Um, I'm very proud of uh, Pine Ridge, my home Oglala Lakota nation, uh, but uh, we incorporated the Disability Act, but unfortunately there's just not the resources for ensuring access to all public buildings. Because many of our public buildings are over hundred years old. Our tribal offices uh -huh. are you know, Indian military barracks. So, so again, the, again, it's advocacy, it's the community, and I guarantee you tribal members or tribal leaders have disability themselves or have a, a family member with a disability. So that's when you identify that, you know, disability is hitting us harder than any other group in America. What can we do as a tribal nation to incorporate regulations and supports so that our tribal members with disability are truly included? And you see little steps here and there, like powwow grounds now have ramps and areas for our elders in wheelchairs to be able to sit. And some of our buildings now are being built with ADA compliance. But many of our communities are, again, we're living in poverty and we don't have those resources to fully implement uh, ADA type of measures. But that doesn't mean we don't stop trying. <clears throat> Anything else I can address? No, thank you. Alrighty, well, thanks. Keep uh, asking the questions and I'm sure other people have similar thoughts as well. So please keep uh, sharing your perspectives and questions. So some of our habits, what are our habits that lead to strength? What are your strengths? So again, we all need to take that look in the mirror every day and make sure that we are accountable to ourselves to make sure that we're walking the talk. So again, it's influence or power possessed by a person, organization, nation, that strength. Do we have strength? Of course we do. We're resilient native people. We're still here after a genocidal effort, an immense genocidal effort to remove us from existence, but it was not successful. We are still here and the seventh generation is here from my perspective. So great things are gonna happen in Indian country. And what a wonderful thing for all of us to be part of that seventh generation from Wounded Knee to where good things are gonna happen, not only for us as native people, but for all of us as human beings. So again, when you look at, uh, this is from a class that I teach. Uh, I have my students do this circle. Again, it's a medicine wheel philosophy, but just identify those four emotion, the, those four uh, human elements, mental, physical, spiritual, emotional. And what do you do to uh, increase your strengths? You know, it could be, I read every day. I want to learn something new every day. From a spiritual aspect, it could be, I sing my traditional songs, my mom, has wonderful memories of grandpa uh, singing morning prayer songs then evening prayer songs every day. So what did that do for her from a spiritual balance aspect? Obviously gave her great strength. From an emotional standpoint, we hug our kids or we do whatever we can so that the next generation has an opportunity to succeed. And then the physical aspect, we all have to deal with staying healthy from a physical 
uh, um, body aspect, but also from what is our physical surroundings in terms of what we're dealing with. So again, I love, I got a sweet tooth, so I got to manage that. I had too many M&Ms last night, I'll admit. Hey. So again, you know, we always have to address this and just do the best we can to stay at the center of our circle. So when you look at this, just kind of use a, this to look at those four elements and say, what are you doing to maintain your strength, your empowerment as an individual? Resilience. So again, here's our four-legged brother here showing resilience. Here are our river relatives showing resilience. Here are our land and sea relatives that are very resilient. Can, when you think of climate change, what are our other relatives dealing with in the river and the root nation and the other nations that we have that are not uh, of the two-legged? So again, the resilience that we have is something leading to balance and self-care. So what are you doing for yourselves? Um, we all need to make sure that we are balanced as best we can so that we can impact the people that we work with the best we can. So when you look at the human elements and uh, here we are spinning around these four elements and wondering how can I get the balance between the mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical. So with these human elements in the mental, for example, now we're in the mental elements, at least I hope so, where you're learning some things uh, from the presenters today. But again, the mental aspects, when you see the synapse of our brains, we all have this element inside that is constantly working. And what are we filling it with? You know, is it those negative manifestations of trauma? Or is it the positive traditional knowledge that we put in there so that the negative manifestations are not able to take over our uh, cognitive capacities or our communication skills. You know, many people are saying, when I get diabetes, you know, when these, uh -huh. happen, it's almost an expectation. And we need to make sure that we are cognizant of those aspects. What do we have in our mental capacity to uh, impact our people with disabilities, as well as our personal lives and our families. And again, our worldview, our culture, our environment, our res reality is always an aspect that will impact us. Spirituality, you know, what are your spiritual connections? It can be religion. Many have uh, chosen religion affiliations as a, their choice of spiritual balance, and that's okay. You know, whatever our beliefs and values is, it's our activities, our ceremony, and do we participate? You know, again, it's, uh, um, I was raised Catholic and I respect the Catholic church, but I uh, participate spiritually through the Lakota way, through our uh, medicine wheel philosophies, through our sweat lodge, through our prayers and songs. That's my connection to the spiritual. So whatever that is that you choose, utilize that as best you can. And again, worldview is impacted by the environment and culture that we have. And here we are in modern technology, as we were here on Zoom, our emotional aspects. And again, when you think of these emojis here, how many here have used an emoji to say, I love you? When maybe you haven't said those words to that person in years. So it's a wonderful tool, but don't forget that we must still have that human aspect. So some of us, it's easier for us to share an emotion through an emoji or through a technology aspect. But don't forget, this is a wonderful tool to share it. I love getting these emojis. But again, isn't it better to get that hug or that personal aspect of emotion that we all need as human beings, that, that emotional connection to our, our family, to our community, the Tioshpae that in which we live. So where is your heart is something we often say. You know, how do you feel? How do you perform day-to-day -day activities? So uh, these are the elements, uh, when you think of the social elements and now social media is even more impactful uh, to our ability to share emotions. And physical, here we are, when you see the fancy dancers, the hoop dancers and our traditional um, shawl dancers, it's wonderful to see uh, them out there, not only representing our culture in a good way, not only representing our traditional knowledge in a good way, but they are exercising. 
you know, do this for a good long dance and you, you, you know, you're going to be tired. So this was not only from a spiritual element that they were, you know, doing this physical activity of dance and song and drumming so that they could have that balance. And when you think of the physical aspects, how many of us are dealing with diabetes or dealing with some of the negative aspects of uh, the outcome of uh, our new nutrition and things of that nature? How many of you still hunt for your food? Or are you hunting for a drive-through, you know, in town? You know, that's how uh, things have changed over the years. And when we think of this mind, body, soul, and heart, we have these four elements, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional, and the physical. And it all ends up being wellness. So that is the outcome. So how do we incorporate this? Through the medicine wheel and my philosophy. It could be the man in the maze and the autumn communities here in Arizona. But we have many circular examples from our tribal nations in which we can utilize our indigenous knowledge. So through the indigenous knowledge, I always go back to the medicine wheel. This is how I was taught from uh, my family as well as the elders that were my mentors over the years. And so the, the medicine wheel represents the directions. It represents the four human elements and it re represents our values, decisions, actions, and reactions. So how do we process some of these things like historical trauma or recent onset disability. Um, a lot of these things we incorporated as a family after my wife's auto accident and uh, she had a, now has a disability as a result. So she used a wheelchair for two years, but we're very fortunate that she's able to walk again and uh, that her leg healed so didn't need to be amputated. So I was looking at all the prosthetics and everything I was ready to go and uh, I just, you know, I said to Natasha, I now understand not only from a, a personal professional aspect that with my dad having a disability, why I was taught to be an advocate, to be a disability, uh, you know, someone that values a person with a disability. So suddenly I was ready to uh, find all the different prosthetics and different things for my wife and just deal with the the reality of disability again. But uh, she still has disability conditions, needs more surgeries. Uh, I've had disability now through heart surgeries and back surgeries. So again, we're just getting older and the natural process of the life experience. If we're fortunate to live long enough, we will all have a disability of some sort. So again, here's our self-care model. You know, the beliefs, the attitudes, activities, and feelings. We need to make sure we're addressing these elements within ourselves so that we can effectively share our knowledge and skills with our community members so that they can learn from us and we can do the best we can to provide those services. And here we are have a question. Oh, sure. Yes. I'm sorry to keep butting in. <laughs> nope. As many. Please do that. As Okay, as many disability advocacy organizations are starting to care more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, indigenous people are sometimes silenced by members of larger ethnic minorities who want us to remain invisible. Mm -hmm. How do we overcome this? Again, the, that's the advocacy and the empowerment. We need to get that confidence and strength to stand up and fight. And I'm not saying fight physically, but fight in terms of advocacy. And I was raised that way from a strong res woman and her anticipation of her sons is that they will represent Lakota men in a good way. And uh, that's something that I I'm very fortunate to have that early on so that I can do what I can to be a strong voice for all native people and our indigenous knowledge on the hill or when I'm uh, testifying before Congress. I'm one, I'm, that's my responsibility. I think that's one of the reasons I'm on this earth to leave those footprints as an advocate for Indian people. But there can only not be us as Indians. We need our non-Indian brothers and sisters to stand with us, to sit with us, to kneel with us, whatever the situation may be. Because if we have our non-Indian brothers and sisters 
joining us as indigenous people, then more change happens. And so again, it's empowerment and advocacy. We cannot allow to be silenced. And that's how I was raised. You will never be silenced. You will represent in a good way. And that's what we need to do for our young ones today that are screaming for this knowledge, this indigenous empowerment, if you will. And it's our responsibility to give them that so that they have that empowerment, that confidence, that strength to be a strong voice for future generations. I hope I answered that okay. Thank you. Any other questions before I close out here? <laughs> I have no, no more questions that I've seen. Okay. So in closing with this, the, the seven values. So we have this in this circle, circle, which is constantly evolving and moving. When you think of a circle, don't uh, think maybe as a planet rotating, but it's not only just a circle, it can be like a tornado, uh, a DNA strand. You know, those are the different elements of circular philosophies that we have. And when you look at these aspects, when we go with up or down or out or back, as well as within, these are the seven rights, the seven values from the Lakota perspective. And if we always uh, put this in our daily living, you know, this could be our uh, 10 commandments from a Christian perspective, if you will, but all of us as two-leggeds can benefit from this model of balance. And ultimately within is humility. We must be humble with the, the strength and empowerment that we get and we must share it for future generations. And that is what we all have as two-leggeds. And here Sitting Bull knew back then what was necessary for future generations. And uh, to quote Sitting Bull, let us put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. And that's what we all want to do, native and non-native. As human beings, we want a better life for our children, for future generations. And from a native standpoint, we're thinking seven generations ahead. And uh, what a wonderful responsibility that is to make sure that the footprints we leave impact those future generations. And that's why we're all here, is that next generation, we want them to have that voice and that strength and that empowerment so that they are the future advocates for Indian country, not only for disability, but for Indian uh, sovereignty, for our role as Indian people in this nation. Uh, we are here to stay and we are growing and we're getting stronger and it's wonderful to see the young ones screaming for that knowledge and let's all of us collectively do whatever we can so they have that knowledge, that strength, that advocacy and that power to make a definite difference and represent in a good way. So that's uh, a closing. I'll stop sharing my screen here. And uh, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, uh, um, you attending this session and I hope you have a great day. And remember all of you are making a difference in your own way. And collectively, whatever little bit of difference we make as a group, as a Teoshpae, a community, we can make a difference for future generations. So Palami Awashte. We have five minutes if anyone has questions or uh, if I missed anything or exp I can explain something better, please let me know. There was one question. Um, I'm trying to get back to it. Um, oh, goodness, I can't see the chat. Mm. <laughs> um, it, it, it was a comment uh, saying that this was great words um, and how do those of us in Arizona um, make, it, make uh, contacts with like minds um, yeah. he said that your, what you say makes total sense how do we make contact with like minds well uh my work, I'm, uh, as I said, I shared, I'm contracted with Sonoran Center. So we're creating new native focused programs. And uh, we ask you to join us to uh, be part of our advisory committees. And 
I'm going to be hiring Arizona Native people to uh, run these programs that I developed, similar to what I did in uh, South Dakota, as well as in San Diego when I was at San Diego State with the old pet air and the care programs. So uh, again, uh, in Arizona, there's other programs that are dealing, uh, addressing disability issues and we'll be partnering with them as well. But look for some of the new programs that we'll be developing through the Sonoran Center. And uh, please join us. We need you that are interested in uh, doing this work and representing in a good way. So look uh, for the Sonoran Center announcements as we develop new programs. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Sonoran, you said posted in the chat, please complete our evaluation for this uh, session. And there is a link to the session one evaluation. So please look in the chat for that link and um, give us some feedback. Thank you. Oh, I see a couple where they want, I'll put in my uh, contact information here. But thanks again, everyone, you're making a difference. Oh, and if I can do a shameless plug, <laughs> go to Amazon Prime and you can see my documentary, Seventh Generation. And we've won 20 awards in 10 different countries. So that was a wonderful, uh, I made the movie just to be an educational tool, but it ended up uh, getting out there on Amazon Prime and other uh, streaming. Uh, and it's doing really well. And it just aired in Belfast, Ireland a couple of weeks ago. So it's really cool to get the message out there. So if you get a chance, give me five stars on Amazon so I can get it on HBO or Netflix. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. We appreciate your, um, your words and your wisdom. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation. It's so good to be back with you at the Disability Summit after a few years. So I'm, it's wonderful you keep it going. So thank you to the committee for your uh, dedication to make sure this continues for the people.